section 88, and we are still busy with the Torah. We are now at section number 5, commandment number 5, honor your father and mother. And under that we have all the laws that has to do with authority and family and parents and obedience and love for your neighbor. Because as Paul says in Galatians 5 verse 14, the entire Torah is properly understood in one word. You will love your neighbor as yourself. And of course, as you know from yesterday's session, Leviticus 19 verse 18 talks about loving your neighbor as yourself. And we talked about who's your neighbor, who's your brother, who's the stranger. How do you treat servants and strangers and how you treat one another? That is what the Torah is all about. And as we asked each other yesterday, how can this world teach that we are no longer having to obey the Torah? Even Paul, whom the church uses to say that we are not under Torah, because they don't understand what that means. How can they teach that we don't do this? Because Paul himself says, you can only really understood everything that Torah is about in this one word, love. And of course the church says that that is all we need, we need love. But love is only understood in the context of the Torah, how do you treat? How don't you treat? What do you do? What don't you do? In the context of the instructions of a loving father that has rules for his house and he wants all his children to obey by those rules because when all obey his rules, there's harmony, there's love, there's patience, there's peace, there's everything that is needed in a successful household, the house of God where everyone must repent to and return to because of sin from the beginning, because of disobedience to his commandments and instructions from Genesis 3, we have lost access to his house and we are all lost sheep desiring to return back to his house. It's all about confessing your sin and understanding what sin is and making restoration for where you have sinned. And coming back into the house of God. Because as Paul says, the entire Torah is properly understood in that one word. Leviticus 19 verse 18. You will love your neighbor as yourself. He says in verse 16. You should walk through the spirit and the lust of the flesh will not consume you. What does that mean to walk through the spirit? We've discussed that in detail in the book of Romans 7 and Romans 8. Where... Paul again, this precious, precious Paul, who is so misunderstood by this world, where he explains that the law of God is the spirit. And the law of sin and death is the disobedience to God. And Yeshua is the only one, Romans 8, 2, that can free us from the law of sin and death. Not free us from the law of God. To walk in loving your neighbor, treating your neighbor as you want to be treated. In walking in that way, you are walking in the spirit. Not only physically does the word teach you what to do and what not to do, but the spirit comes like oil on the sacrifice and he brings you that deeper understanding of how to treat people even with your words don't gossip and all those things we discussed don't hate your brother in your heart that is what it means to walk after the spirit it's it doesn't mean like so many people teach us that to walk after the spirit you just do what you feel the spirit tells you my church have told me that the Spirit told them they don't have to keep Sabbath. They can continue doing the day of the sun. Is that what the Bible means when he says, walk after the Spirit and the lust of the flesh will not subdue you? For flesh desires a thing that is against the Spirit. And the Spirit desires a thing that is against the flesh. As we know, from the Garden of Eden, God's Spirit desired that Adam and Eve should not eat from the tree of knowledge and should not listen to the serpent. Yet Adam and Eve, Chava, their desire 
their fleshly desire was to listen to the serpent and taste that forbidden fruit. And that only brought them death because disobedience to what God's desire is, is the law of sin and death. And that is what Yeshua came for. When we then understand that we are under the judgment of Torah because of disobedience and we confess our sins and we bring the sacrifice of life because the wages of sin is death. So a sacrifice of life must be brought. So for 4,000 years before Messiah became, the word became flesh. Lambs were brought and the blood was atoning the disobedience and was bringing reconciliation between man and God. And now we have the Lamb, the Word Himself that manifested and died in our place. We bring that sacrifice. We confess our sin under the blood of Messiah in His name. Understanding what sin is. And understanding that forgiveness of sin is not cheap grace. It cost him his life because we were dead in our sins. And he had to revive us from that. And the only way was to give his own life. And that's why the Torah teaches. Not the New Testament. But the Torah teaches that we must repent and confess our wrongdoings. I'm going to read to you Numbers 5 verse um, from verse 6. Speak unto the children of Israel, Moses, says Yahuwah, when a man or a woman shall commit any sin that man commits, to do a trespass against Yahuwah, and that person is guilty, then, verse 7, they shall confess their sin which they have done. That is what atonement and reconciliation and forgiveness is all about. Forgiveness is not one little prayer, Lieve Jesus, vergewe all my sonde. And, and now you suddenly, with one prayer, Jesus, please just forgive all my sin. Now with one prayer that you made, I don't know, 10, 20, 30, 40 years ago, you now have a ticket to heaven. You are now in the kingdom of God. With one little prayer, you haven't even confessed nothing. You can only confess sin if you know what sin is. If you understand that the commandments of God says, for instance, that you can't eat unclean animals. But you don't know that unclean animal eating pork and, and prawns and all those delicious things that the world eats. If you don't know that that means sin, how will you ever confess it? If nobody ever teaches you to look into the beautiful instructions of a loving father to understand what sin is, how will you ever confess it? How will you know that you even have sinned? That's why God says in Isaiah 4, My people are perishing for a lack of knowledge. They are going to keep um, or they are going to remain in their death, in their destruction because of a lack of knowledge. So they don't know my Torah. He says in Hosea 4, because they have rejected my Torah, they have rejected knowledge. And now because of their lack of knowledge, they are perishing. The wages, the result of sin is death. But the way back is life. Yeshua came so that we can have life. The Torah of God came in the flesh so that we can read him and understand him in the New Testament. And suddenly the Old Testament is broken up because we see the whole Torah is summarized in love God and love your neighbor. And we break those Two commandments up in two parts and then under each one of those parts come all the rest of the law and the prophets, as Yeshua says, is hanging onto these two main commandments. That is why the Torah is so beautiful. But even saying the word Torah to most Christians, they hate it, they reject it because they don't understand it, because they are rejecting that beautiful knowledge that brings people to an understanding of truth, they will never be able to confess all their sins. 
Sin is, like God explains in the Bible, sin is transgression of his Torah. We've looked at that so many times already in the book of 1 John um, 2 verse 3 and 1 John 3 verse 4. Sin is transgression of the law. And as God says in Numbers 5 verse 7, you shall confess your sin. John repeats it. 1 John 1 verse, let me start with uh, verse 7. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with each other. Do you see how Leviticus 19 verse 18 is confirmed here? You can only really love your neighbor if you walk in the light, if you walk in the path that is lighted by the um, rules and regulations of a loving father that wants his children to walk in his instructions so that there's no disputes among them, there's no hatred, there's not even gossip, there's, there's, there's no transgressions of his holy law and he can protect them against the, the vials of the enemy and it can protect them like we looked in Acts 15 against the uh, prostitution and the blood and the sacrifices and the deception that is going on at pagan temples. You come back into his authority, into his co uh, commandments and obedience so that he can protect you. But the moment you, you come out from under his authority and, and if you disobey his commandments, his hand is lifted from you. And how, how can we always blame God when things go wrong in our life? We hardly ever look at what we are doing, but we, we like to blame God. How can God allow this? How can God do this? How can God do that? I hear that from Christians all the time. How can God not protect me in this situation? I want to tell you, you're not even in the camp. You are still transgressing his Torah. You are still in Egypt. You have stayed behind in Egypt. You have not left Egypt with Israel. You are not in the wilderness being instructed in his light. You are not on your way following Moses to the promised land. How can you blame God when you sit in Egypt and, and God's people is already on their way to the promised land? You have fellowship with each other and the blood of Messiah cleanses us from all sins. How does the blood of Messiah cleanse you from all sins? Just quickly, with one quick little prayer? No. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. And the truth, the truth is only found in the Torah. The truth is not in you because God's instructions is truth. He teaches you what is right and what is wrong. We don't choose like most people that sit under the tree of good and evil, right and wrong, and they decide, or they let the religion decide for them what is right and wrong. No. The truth must be inside of you. Only then can you understand what sin is. So if you say you have no sin, then it's because people say, I'm not sinning, because they don't know, for instance, and I. this is just the easiest way to explain it. When people eat unclean animals, they don't know that it is sin. Therefore, they say, we have no sin. As long as we don't murder and steal and deceive, we, ha we have no sin. We love Jesus. We love our neighbor. We are good people. We have no sin. But John says, if you say you have no sin, you're a liar. You're deceiving yourself. The serpent doesn't even have to deceive you. He can just sit back and laugh because you're deceiving yourself. He says the truth is not in us. But, verse 9, as Numbers 5 verse 7 says, If we confess our sins, and you can only confess your sin when you know what you have done wrong. And as you study these Bible studies with us, you learn all the commandments of God. And every time you recognize something in your own life that you and your family and your grandfathers and your great-grandfathers have done all your lives, and you understand suddenly, oh, this is against the will of the Father, you confess it. You might be confessing 50 times a day. And that is great because Yeshua says, how many times must we forgive each other? Up to 70 times times 7. God, God can never 
Get tired of your confessions. He says all over the Bible, read the book of Psalms. If you want to confess, use the Psalms. It's beautiful. David teaches us how to confess. I lie in my bed and my bed is wet with my tears and I confess my sin and you hear me. You hear and you you taste my heart and you taste my kidneys and you on shook me in the night time on my bed. And you lay bare the intentions of my heart. And I confess everything I've done against your will. And John con- uh, confirms, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and he is righteous to forgive us our sins. And not only to forgive you your sins, your disobedience to him, but also to cleanse you from all iniquity. And by now you know iniquity is anomia, and anomia in Greek means lawlessness. He cleanses you from the lawlessness so that the lawless one, the Antichrist, the serpent, does not have a hold on you anymore. The Torah is beautiful, absolutely beautiful, and it is the most misunderstood um, doctrine ever. And I'm so grateful this day that you are interested. You have heard the Good Shepherd's voice. You as a lost little sheep have listened and shema to his voice and you've turned back. You've teshuvat. You are interested to hear everything he has to teach you. Okay, let's continue. Numbers 5 or 7, you will then confess your sin which they have done. And he shall, listen to this, because confession of sin is not just about saying you're sorry. He shall recompense his trespass with the principle thereof and add unto it a fifth part thereof and give it unto him against whom he has trespassed. We have discussed this many times. And I said to you, if you have trespassed against somebody, um, you know, we don't go around stealing each other's sheep or oxen or donkey or something. So we can't give back, you know, five donkeys. <laughs> but if you've sinned against somebody, um, I, I even um, made a suggestion like this. Then you owe them five cups of coffee or five cups of tea, five visits. Make up recompense for the sin you've done against against somebody. And for somebody who has done sin against you from our side, as the Torah teaches, you don't bear a grudge. We, We looked at that yesterday. So from both sides, whether you have been sinned against, you don't bear a grudge. You forgive because you have been forgiven. And if you you confess our sins, he is faithful. So if somebody else confesses their sins to you, you must be faithful. Just like your father. Just like your Messiah. And even if they don't confess their sin, doesn't the Bible say that God shines the sun over the good and the evil people? Doesn't the Bible say that God lets it rain over good and evil people? So even if people don't confess their sin to you, you find it in your heart like your Messiah to die in yourself, die in your right, die in your um, offense. Take the um, thorns of bitterness and hatred and, 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 and heartbreak, heartache and pain. Take those thorns out of your heart and um, braid it into a crown and wear a thorn crown just like your Messiah and forgive them even if they didn't confess because it's not about them confessing it's about you living a holy unblemished life before your father and like Yeshua said if you don't forgive others God cannot forgive you so you recompense by giving a fifth part back to him against whom you have trespassed But if the man have no kinsman, we are back now in Numbers 5.8. If the man have no kinsman to recompense the trespass to, let the trespass be recompensed unto Yahuwah, even to the priest. Beautiful, absolutely beautiful. So if you sinned against somebody and that person is maybe not available anymore or he moved to another country or he's dead or whatever the situation is, you bring that sacrifice, that love 
that forgiveness, um, then you bring it to Yahuwah. In, in, the, in the biblical times, um, if somebody had to bring a sacrifice or an offering to recompense to the person and that person wasn't in, even there anymore, he would bring that sacrifice to the temple or to the tabernacle and it will go to Yahuwah. Because things must be balanced. God can come and with the blood of Messiah wipe away the judgment of death over you because of sin. But when you sin against God, the blood of Messiah balances it out. But when you sin against people, God still forgives you and your sins are blotted out. But the balance is not there yet until you have made right with the other person. Something will always remain out of balance until you experience the freedom. Once you've looked somebody in the eye, and you recompensed what you've done wrong to them. Even if it was something small. Just to, to break down the wall that might be between you and somebody else. It is the most beautiful liberty that you can find. And that is also what Paul describes in Galatians 4 and 5. The Pharisees were trying to bring people under obedience to the law without them understanding repentance and love and um, a relationship with God um, but liberty real liberty is walking in faithful obedience in the good instructions and also having that instruction enlighten your heart and and removing all darkness and all hatred and all bitterness and all pain and and all grudges and all revenge out of your heart absolutely beautiful okay let's continue Deuteronomy uh, 22 verse 13. This is all about um, marriage and women and, and how to um, really look after your bride. Deuteronomy 22 verse 13. If a man takes a wife and go in unto her and hate her and give occasion of speech against her and bring up an evil name upon her and say, I took this woman and when I came to her, when, when he went into his marriage bed, I found her not to be a virgin. Then shall the father of the damsel and the mother take and bring forth the tokens of the damsel's virginity unto the elders of the city at the gate. And the damsel's father shall say unto the elders, I gave my daughter unto this man. Um, as a wife and he hates her and lo he has given occasion of speech against her so he has gossiped um, I found that your daughter is not a virgin but yet here are the tokens that she is indeed a virgin and then they will spread the cloth before the elders of the city and the elders of that city shall take that man and chastise him and they shall immerse him in um, an hundred shekels of silver and give that unto the father of the virgin, because he has brought up an evil name upon a virgin of Israel, and he and she shall be his wife, and he may never divorce her all of his days. That's quite beautiful. At the end of the day, just remember, as Dinah was um, raped, and her brothers Levi and Shimeon, they also did not accept um, that a daughter of Israel was given a bad name. So, you know, they didn't only chastise, they murdered. We discussed that in detail. But so is God. God's virgin, his bride, that has done wrong, but has confessed all her sins, and has been washed clean by blood, and has... And, She's living in the spirit now, wanting to please her husband. She's a virgin, and God will not allow an evil name to be brought over her. So the people of this world and the enemies of God, who is calling all of those who who's returning back to God, who's coming out of Babylon and out of Egypt and is living an obedient lifestyle, not only talking bad about them and bringing an evil name upon them, God will destroy all those people. He will recompense a fifth to all the people that have sinned against his bride. But besides that, the enemy 
that is trying to make the bride a whore, trying to seduce her in serving an alternative version of God with alternative religious traditions, he will be destroyed. The elders chastised and uh, penalized the man that brought an evil report about the virgin. And so will God do as well. All of those who bring an evil report on his bride, they will be chastised. And they will not only receive a penalty of a hundred shekels of silver, they will receive eternal death. Their penalty will be eternal death, judgment. God will judge and he will bring upon them the stripes and the judgment and the punishment that they deserve. And he will judge them according to their works and according to the words of their mouth. That's why the Bible says, don't speak vain words because every word is recorded in the heavenly books. Everything that people speak against the bride of God will be recompensed. Not once, not twice, but five times on their heads. When you are part of this lost sheep that come back to the good shepherd and he washes you clean, white as wool, and you become part of the bride, don't let the cruel words of this world make you lose your love or your faith to your husband. You just continue on the straight path. Let your lamp burn in the window so wash and, and make ready your bridal gown. Keep your hands and your heart and your mind and your soul clean, kosher in front of your holy God. Because when he comes back, when your bridegroom comes back and he cleanses this world and he comes to fetch you and take you to his promised land, his beautiful Jerusalem, to live and reign with you forever, all those that is now pointing a finger in your face will receive their reward. Don't bear grudges against nobody. Pray for them. Because those who pray in the streets, the angel is sent out with the ink pot and he finds people in the streets praying for Jerusalem and praying for the bride of God. And he marks them on their foreheads with the name of God. You do that while you are ridiculed, while you may be persecuted. The end times are upon us, guys. Vaccines are coming, microchips are coming, one world religion is coming, one world order is coming. The whole world have their mouths shut with masks. The end times is coming and you need to have the name of your God written on your forehead. Pray for this world. Pray for the people of God. Pray for the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Pray for the Jews. Pray for your family and your friends. Pray and let God hear your voice mixed with your tears, your sacrifice mixed with salt. Confess for them in front of your God until your God can have grace and send his Ruach and his word to pierce their hearts. And they can also turn to God. Don't fight with family. Don't try and convince family of anything. Pray for them. Don't bring evil report. Bring the spirit inside your house, inside your family. So the marriage agreement um, is holy in front of God. God hates evil reports he hates lies that's why he says there must be no false witness that you bring against your neighbor and this man that brings a false witness against a woman if he marries her and it goes into her on the first night and for some reason he doesn't like her anymore then he thinks by just saying oh she's not a virgin i don't have to be married to her um then he thinks he can just quickly get rid of her no god says if you've taken a wife then you're gonna stuck with her you're gonna love her and you're going to learn to like her. And you're going to be sanctified in your communion with her. And uh, you're not going to bring an evil report. Because you will be chastised. And you'll be penalized. Um, Deuteronomy 23 verse 18. Let me just jump. Deuteronomy 23 verse 18 says. 
It's got to do that you will not have uh, sexual relations with women that's not married by means of a marriage agreement and sanctification. So the verse 18 says, You shall not bring the hire of a whore or the price of a dog into the house of Yahuwah, your Elohim. For even both these are an abomination upon Yahuwah. Basically, um, what it means is that when lots of people say, God, if you can just let me win the lottery, you know, then I will give a lot of money to the church. <laughs> God doesn't God doesn't want your money that comes from whores and dogs or lotteries or any um, illegal ways of earning money. You can shove your money where it's dark. He doesn't want it. You, you don't bring the hire of a whore or the price of a dog into the house of Yahuwah for any of your vows. Because everything unclean is an abomination unto Yahuwah. Even your money. If your money is not earned with working hard for six days and resting on the seventh, being honest. He doesn't want it. You can Honestly, you can shove it. He doesn't want people to win the lottery so they can give money to the church. The old lady that brought two little, small little penny coins to the temple and she threw it into the money treasury box. Yeshua said she gave more than all the Pharisees who brought treasure after treasure. Um, the Bible also says don't, um, don't um, withhold food or clothing or sexual relations from your wife. So um, it's, everything that's got to do with, with chastity and, and uh, morality and the beautiful holiness of marriage, it's got to do with how you look after your wife. So you, you don't have sexual relations with a woman unless you are married by a marriage agreement. And sanctification, um, just to return back to that. And that's got nothing to do with having a church service. You're not married when you have a church service. You are married when there's a marriage agreement. When the two families, um, for those of you that have done the Bible study of the Ten Virgins, um, again, you can have the Ten Virgins Bible study on the YouTube channel for Two Trees in the Garden. Just go to the website, click on YouTube and do that. There we go into detail about how the process of the Hebrew marriage works. If a man likes a woman and he sends his father to the woman's, um, to the virgin's father, and they agree that the marriage can proceed, then basically those two people are betrothed and they are married. And, and once um, the house is ready and the man goes to fetch his bride and takes her into his house and he takes her into his bed, he's married. You don't need a church service. You don't have to have a domini declare you married. That's just a religious doctrine. You don't need that piece of paper that's signed by your government to say that you're married. In our society, yes, that is the way that we do it. But in God's eyes, like Isaac took Rebecca into his mother's tent and he loved her the rest of his life. He had a intercourse with her and they were married. That's what married, marriage is. You can have a beautiful wedding. You can have a ceremony. But don't let the world tell you you have to have a church service to prove that you are married. The moment you sleep with somebody, you are married to that person and you cannot sleep with anybody else ever again because now you're in the sight of God. You're in a sanctified agreement. And you don't withhold food or clothing or sexual relations from your wife. If, um, if anything happens and... In the old days, sometimes they had two or three wives. But God said, because God is a God of love and he, and he cares about everyone and he wants you to care about everyone. So in the olden days, even when there was a second or a third wife, God says, you must look after all your wives. You don't withhold food. You, if she wants clothing, you give it to her. If she wants to be intimate with you, you don't withhold yourself from your wife. But it's the other way around as well. Hey, wives, we don't withhold any of that from our husbands.
So the Bible is also about um, having children with your wife. I mean, Genesis 128, God's biggest desire is to have lots of kids. He wants Abraham and his seed, Jacob and his seed from the beginning. He wants lots of children. He said to Adam and Eve, multiply in the face of the earth. He said to Noah, multiply in the face of the earth. And there's going to be multiple children in the kingdom of God. He loves children. But he wants children that comes out of a sanctified, holy agreement, a marriage, not children outside of marriage. I just quickly want to read to you Exodus 21 verse 10. 21 verse 10. Do, do, do. <clears throat> so if a man um, takes another wife, then his first wife, her food, her clothing, her duty of marriage, which means intimacy, shall not be diminished. Um, and if he do not do these things unto her, then shall she go out um, free without money. I don't really understand that. Um, but I know that God says that a man mustn't neglect his wife at all. Um, this verse, I'm, I'm not going to discuss this verse because I unfortunately don't understand it. Then she shall go out free without money. I think it's got to do that she will go free if she no longer wants to stay. And then without money, um, I don't think that um, that's got to do with her husband sending her away without money. Um, I think it's got to do with a bridal price or something. Um, and um, she doesn't have to pay the dowry. But I, um, I don't understand this. I'm going to confess that to you. So I want to continue. Um, issue a divorce by means of a document. And this document is called a get. This divorce document. Um, Deuteronomy 24, Deuteronomy 24, verse 1. When a man has taken a wife and married her, and it comes to pass that she finds no favor in his eyes, because he has found some uncleanness in her, then let him write her a bill of divorce, and give it in her hand, and send her out of his house. This is very important for us to understand, because there's a lot of controversy regarding divorced women and we are going to discuss that in tomorrow's section but not only are we going to look at the new testament and what paul says divorced women aren't allowed to marry again we're going to look at all those controversial things right but we're also going to look at how god gave the house of israel a get a get is called um uh, it's a divorce document and we know that the Bible talks about the fact that God gave the house of Israel a divorce document. And we're going to look into all of this in detail. Because not only is the Torah commandments, not only are we learning how to confess our sins, but we also have to learn about this whole process of a God who had to divorce his wife and a man who had to die because a wife cannot marry the same husband again. And a man that, that died, and when, when he rose again, he is now, that divorce document is cancelled and he can marry his bride again. It is so amazing, this Torah, that teaches us everything about the bridegroom and his bride. So we have to spend time with this. So we're going to discuss this tomorrow. I hope you have a blessed day. And uh, I'll see you tomorrow.